Thank you. You can grab a seat. Thank you, team. Beautiful sense of presence of God as we worship there. Thank you, Pastor Errol. I, I appreciate that and I honour you for all that you're doing here and everyone in the region too. Um, got me a bit emotional bringing up John. Bit of a hero of mine. I had the privilege of working with him. When I say working with him, reining him in. <laughs> if you know John Lewis, but... Uh, yeah, he went to be in his eternal reward a couple of years ago. I'd only been in the role for a little bit. and uh, Yeah, but man, smiling now, causing a lot of trouble up there. <laughs> hey, if I can uh, keep building on to the next part of today, it is all about activating your faith and it is all about you getting in the pool, jumping in the water, uh, saying yes to the call of God on your life. And that is the entire purpose uh, right across today. And I really feel privileged to, to bring the next part, I suppose, of my word with you this morning. And uh, I don't know, across about 18 years of ministry, uh, you often see men hold back. And I think there's any number of reasons why I referred to that earlier. And for that reason, my favourite Bible character is, is Peter. I just think you can't get past him. Uh, in my mind, Peter was Australian. Uh, he would talk and think afterwards. He would do things and go, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. I, I just love him. You know, at one moment, Peter's on the mountaintop with Jesus saying, this is amazing. You know, this is the most incredible thing ever. You know, you are the Christ, you know, getting it right. Yes, well done, Peter. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. Only by my Father did this get revealed to you. And the very next moment, get behind me, Satan. I just really relate to Peter. I reckon there's some days where I just feel like, man, you know, the Lord's speaking straight to my heart. And on the days, the Lord is like, you're acting a bit like Satan. What I love about the Spirit of God, what I love about how Jesus treats Peter, He never calls him a failure. He never writes him off. He never says you're too far gone. In fact, every step that Peter would take that we would look at and say, that's a misstep, God was just taking him up. At some point in your faith, you have to realise that you spend a lot of time going around in circles. Sometimes you think to yourself, I'm here again. I've got the same problem, the same thoughts, same habits, same addictions. And sometimes you think to yourself, gosh, Lord, when will you just give up on me? When are you just going to move on? And I just sense the grace of God on you right now. Every time you see yourself doing a circle, realise you're not doing the same circle. You're actually going up. It's an upward spiral. You are going upwards. It feels circular, but He is always taking you up. In fact, there's a guy in my church who flies gliders, um, those weird planes without motors. And he says, if you want to go up, you always have to look for one of those updrafts. He says, you can always see Him in the clouds. And the way to go up is you don't just catch it and go straight up. You catch that updraft, kind of what you were saying before, Pastor Errol, you catch that updraft and it spirals and you spiral your glider and that's how you go further up. And can I tell you by the Spirit of God, I think He's taking us up. He's leading us higher. He's taking us to new levels. And, and what you have to do in the midst of all of that is realise that not every day does it feel like you're going to be kicking down doors, you're going to be going. Some days you feel like you're spiralling. You're going upwards though. It might feel like a circle, but that circle is going up. You're here again, but you're better than where you were before. And this is why I want to talk about Peter is because Peter relates to us and we relate to Peter. He didn't get it right all the time, but Jesus never, ever gave up on him. So if you've got a Bible this morning, I want to look at the calling of Peter in Luke chapter 5. As I said, Peter is my favourite character. And here we see the calling of Peter. Luke has taken five chapters to get to the calling of Peter, which I like because he's really set everything up. Luke chapter 5. Verse 1, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around Him and listening to the Word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. It's important that you know Jesus is also smart. Have you ever thought of that before? Jesus is also smart. 
You know, he knows that if I actually am on the water, water travels seven times stronger across the water. That's at least a 10 decibel increase in my volume, creating a natural amphitheatre. I like the idea that Jesus just knew exactly what he was doing. But something else is interesting. This required Peter, not yet a disciple, to remain with the boat, rowing it in place. Now, it wasn't tidal. There would have been a wind current only. But it required Peter to be on the oars because they didn't have an anchor system to keep Jesus in the same spot, sitting under the Word of God. I, I love that idea. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. One of the most powerful words you can ever say, but because you say so. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll fish for people. So pull their boats up on shore. Left everything and followed him. Let me just pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. And we give it its proper place in our lives. We give it authority. We place ourselves under it so we can be instructed by it. But I pray above all for a spirit of wisdom and revelation that Jesus, we would know you better and we'd be changed by you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I love the calling of Peter. I find it amazing that just a few verses earlier, Peter was at Simon's house, Simon Peter's house. He was there and remember, his mother-in-law had that horrible fever and, you know, he didn't follow Jesus after that. And I have in my notes here to insert a mother-in-law joke as Jesus healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law, but I refuse to tell a mother-in-law joke. Suffice it to say, it didn't cause Peter to follow him. You draw your own conclusions. It's interesting to me that Simon Peter in his own house has Jesus there, and yet it did not produce saving faith or following faith in Peter. You see, we live under the illusion that a miracle would cause people to come to follow Jesus. Can I tell you, time and again in the New Testament, time again in the modern era, miracles alone do not produce saving faith. And we often pray that, don't we? We often think to ourselves that, oh, if my friend or my family member, if they just saw a radical miracle take place in their life, then they would follow Jesus. This reminds us that that just didn't happen. It doesn't happen. We often think if they just got a miracle, they'd follow Jesus. That is not actually what happens. Simon Peter has Jesus in his own home. Jesus does an amazing miracle in healing his mother-in-law. And yet for some reason, Peter is not yet following Jesus. Why? Miracles alone do not produce saving faith. In fact, the writer of Hebrews would say in Hebrews 4, that the gospel was of no value to them because they didn't mix it with faith. And you can see everything and hear everything, but if you don't mix it with your own internal faith, and I've got to tell you, just a mustard seed faith, it's of no good to you. Again, like I was saying earlier, you can be around something. Proximity is different to intimacy. You can be near something. We can be talking about the wind of the Holy Spirit, but you've got to mix it with your own faith. Sometimes it's a tiny little mustard seed. But I love this because if we elaborated throughout the Gospels, the story of the calling of Peter, Peter actually went to, uh, Jesus actually went to Peter's synagogue preached in Peter's synagogue, Peter would have been sitting there. Jesus goes to Peter's house, he would have been sitting there. Jesus now goes to Peter's job and now in Peter's boat. In fact, everywhere Peter goes, Jesus seems to be following him. Sometimes that happens in our lives as well. Every now and then you just think to yourself, Lord, I thought I left you at church on Sunday. It's Monday morning. What are you doing here? 
Oh, I thought I left you in the worship set on the Sunday night, but what are you doing here? Have you ever experienced that where you just feel like Jesus keeps on turning up in your life or the presence of the Holy Spirit just keeps on turning up? Because we want to compartmentalise our faith, but Jesus says, I want every part of your life. And so He comes to your house, He comes to your worship place, He comes to your job and He sits in your boat and He just keeps on turning up. I'm sure you have this in your own life. I have this a fair bit back where I'm from. And, uh, you know, you'll, you'll see someone from church, you know, uh, at Woolies and, and you're there and, you know, you kind of, you see each other straight away and you kind of can't get away from each other. And it's kind of like the initial, like, oh, g'day, how are you? Hi, great, getting some lettuce, excellent. Lettuce has gone up, hasn't it? Yep, $12, oh boy. All right. And then you, you go and you're like, you know, you feel like you've nailed that conversation. You know, you've done well. And, and then you run into again, them again at the cereal aisle. And it's just, oh, hello. And then you run into them again in the frozen section. And then at this stage, you've got no more words. You just kind of let out noises. It's okay, man. You know, you, you just keep running into them. I mean, there's nothing worse. In fact, I did this once with Brian Houston. I had a great chat with him. I worked up the courage, said good day, never met him before. And then we went and hopped in the same lift. So that, was, that was a good conversation. What floor? You know, I don't know what it is, but for some reason I have these things happen all the time in my life where I just keep on seeing the same people and they keep on popping up and it gets more and more awkward. Can I tell you, this is how Jesus reaches us. And maybe even today, He is prompting your heart that actually time and again, everywhere you go, you keep on experiencing His presence. You, you think you left Him somewhere, but He keeps on popping up. You think that you left Him in a safe place at church. You left Him in your morning devotionals. And yet He's there. Why is that? Because He wants to be intimately involved in every part of your life. And He is waiting for you to answer the call. And as men, we keep on kicking that call down the road. We know what it is. We keep on feeling that prompting to get breakthrough, to go for God more, to, to lead our families in the ways of the Lord, to commit to church, to jump in the small group. And we know that prompting and He just keeps on turning up. Can I tell you, if He did it for Peter, He'll keep on doing it for you. He is gonna keep on knocking on that door until you answer the call. And maybe here today, you're going, oh, great, I know exactly what it is. I've been putting it off. And can I tell you, most of our faith is about inconveniencing ourselves to step out. I love the text here. I love how Peter actually says this so politely. Verse four, he says, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon very politely answered, Master, We've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. The typical fishing in the Sea of Gennesaret or the Sea of Galilee in the ancient Near East was not a typical pole fishing or even spear fishing for that matter. It wasn't that kind of fun, enjoyable, even recreational fishing. It was fishing to survive. And predominantly, it was a dragnet type of fishing. And in fact, it wasn't just that it was a like recreational thing, it was survival, but it was very hard physical work. In fact, when Jesus arrives on the scene, it, it says very specifically that Simon Peter was washing his nets. There was a technique that was involved in this. They would bring the nets out. They would repair the nets. They would wash the nets. They would dry the nets. They would fold the nets and return them back to the boat. When Peter says, we have worked hard, he, he's not just saying like it's, it was a hard night. He's saying, we have worked hard physically hard, but because you say so. Now notice this, if Peter was washing the nets, then no doubt he had washed the nets and they were drying the nets. And then Jesus hops in his boat. When Jesus says to go back and catch a, uh, put your nets down into the deep water, he says this, go out in the deep water during the day. Peter actually has to go back to shore to collect the nets again and then go out. I think for you and I, when I've often read this, we kind of think Peter already had the nets on his boat. There is no way because he was washing, drying and folding the nets. So after Jesus preaches, he goes back to shore after I've worked hard all night and reloads them again to catch it again. There was a physical exhaustion here that Peter is getting at. And I don't know about you, 
But I have often find that there are miracles and God encounters on the other side of our physical tiredness. On the other side of our inconveniences, there are miracles that Jesus has in store for us. And Peter says, we have worked hard all night. It's a very interesting detail that Peter would say, we have worked hard, but we've also worked hard all night. Why is he saying this? Because this kind of fishing exclusively, this dragnet fishing took place exclusively at night time. It never, ever took place in the daytime. There's an additional piece which is interesting here. Let out your nets in the deep water. Not only did this fishing take place only at night time, it also took place in shallow water. There's no way for the nets to hit the bottom in the deep water. And in fact, they would be in deep water, but they would always be casting into shallow water. All of a sudden, Jesus is breaking through all of the norms that Peter was growing up understanding. You've got to understand this. Peter was a lifelong generational fisherman. His grandfather, father, everyone had passed on the techniques of fishing. Jesus is a generational carpenter. And now the generational carpenter is saying to the generational fishermen, I know you normally fish at night time and I know you normally cast in the shallow water. I want you in the daytime, in the deep water to let down your nets. This is crazy. But every now and then Jesus comes to you and asks you to do things that perhaps you're not comfortable with. And every now and then Jesus comes to you even with the inconvenience of faith and saying, I want you to step out in faith. Understand that this deep water Fishing is a phenomenal thing for Peter to actually think about. And you imagine being told by a generational fisherman and you're a generational carpenter, how to do your job. How wonderful that would be. And yet Peter, with a little bit of faith, he says these powerful lines, but because you said so. I've got two young boys in my house, 13 and 11. One of the things that you very rarely hear in our house is, Dad, it's not my job. Dad, I don't want to do it. But because you say so, I would love to. <laughs> yeah, I, I have never heard those beautiful words. <laughs> Can you imagine in your, in your life, in your faith, in your walk with Jesus, if you got a because you said so in your spirit? Could you imagine if you lived your faith in a way that said, it doesn't make sense, it's inconvenient, I don't want to do it, I've never done it that way, but because you say so, Lord, I'll do it. But because you say so, I'll reach out in faith. You think about this. What if Jesus asked you to do some things to catch the wind of what the Holy Spirit is doing, but it doesn't make much sense to you and it's inconvenient and it's difficult for you, but you get in your spirit today, but because you say so. But because you say so, I'll shout that person coffee, but because you say so, I'll reach out in the lunchroom and lay my hands on someone. But because you say so, I will give that person that word. But because you say so, I'll start to do things for my family that I've never done before. But because you say so, I'll drag myself to church. But because you say so, Imagine if you had that same thing in your spirit. See, I think we have a thousand reasons why we don't, but imagine if you just had the one reason, but because you say so. Imagine that was your one reason for doing everything from this point on, but because Jesus said so, I'll do it. Imagine living that kind of way. You see, we often think that God is always agreeing with us, always affirming us, always telling us how good we are, always patting us on our back. Can I tell you, When people tell me that about their faith, I think they're making him up. Because I'll tell you this, God challenges me, stirs me, tells me to get rid of things, tells me to move on. In fact, I don't know about you, but, you know, this is also one of the main ways you know you're married. If you have someone who always agrees with you, tells you to never change, tells you you're the best, tells you you're the most amazing thing in the world and you never have to change a thing, you're the best, just be who you are, only affirms and never challenges you. I don't think you're married. (laughs) 
Honestly, we, we think to ourselves that God's main job is to just stroke us on the back and say, good boy, I know your heart. No, He doesn't do that. He says, come on, I've got more for you. Come on, step up. Come on, raise your spirit. Do something that's gonna activate your faith. Stretch it out in faith because you say so, Lord. I think we live in a world that predominantly follows a God that they make up. Because if your God always agrees with you, only ever affirms you, I don't think He's real. But the God who I serve, the Jesus in me, the Holy Spirit that constantly stirs my spirit is always reminding me there is more for me, not letting us settle. But because you say so. Simon Peter, when he had done so in verse 6, they caught such a large number of fish that the nets began to break. They signaled their partners over. Verse 8, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And then Jesus said to them, said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. Do you notice Simon's response there? He sees this incredible miracle. And then he says, Lord, go away from me. I'm a sinful man. Part of the beauty of coming to Christ is that things are actually exposed in your life. And we like to withhold that. But once again, Peter is exposed. But in a really good sense, the exposure that Peter faces brings almost instant healing by Jesus' affirmation. And so often we think it works the other way around. So often we think we've got to fix our lives and then we come to Him. We, we, we don't do it that way. In fact, religion will tell you, follow the path and maybe you can enter the door of life. That's not what it means to follow Jesus. Jesus is the door so you can follow the path. And time and again, we see this in Scripture. And in this moment, Simon Peter's life and heart is exposed. And he says, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. And I don't know about you, but when I think about my real radical God encounters, I don't often say that they're warm and fuzzy and just nice feeling moments. I would describe often God encounters for me. I'm more like trauma. If you study the biblical text, you see time and again, the people who encounter the goodness and the glory of the Lord, they, they actually experience a good kind of trauma. Isaiah, woe is me, I am ruined. Jeremiah, no way, Lord. You get to Saul, he's knocked off his horse. Time and again throughout Scripture, when people encounter God, they experience an amount of trauma, but it is a good kind of trauma that removes guilt and shame and sin and activates us in our faith. In fact, if you went and saw any kind of a personal trainer, we went to a park and you see all this CrossFit stuff and all that kind of thing. I don't know why people do it. I'm not up for that. And you kind of watch that and you kind of go, wow, that's cool. But if you didn't know what was going on, if you had no frame of reference for what was taking place, you would look out and you would go, huh, it appears as though that person is trying to kill that person very slowly. Yeah, give them a long, slow, gruelling death. Interesting. Maybe we should report that. You know, when Jesus comes into your life, He is coming to you to give you a small amount of trauma, but growth, challenge, but take you up a level, stir you. And maybe in some sense, it's uncomfortable, but He builds muscle and strength. That is what happens in the life of Peter when he encountered Him. And sometimes we hold ourselves back because we think we have to get ourselves right. Only by bringing our whole hearts and exposing our lives to Him does Jesus bring that healing. He says this, that you will actually fish for people. Do not be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything and followed him. You know, for Simon Peter, as a generational fisherman, this is the equivalent of winning the ancient lottery. I mean, you and I think, what a great story. He could do something with that fish or, or wow, that would have been really amazing. No, no, no. No, this is the equivalent of winning the lottery. This is everything that Peter would have always dreamed about. This was his big dream. This was his big goal in life was to at one point win 
the ancient lottery. And you know what? He walked away from it. Why? To me, it shows that in Jesus, he realised that I've got everything that I need. You see, every one of us have goals in our lives, uh, things we're aiming at, things we're achieving for. In fact, my, young, my eldest son, Cooper, when he was quite young, probably about eight or nine, he always wanted to play professional football. We were in America uh, and he said, I want to play professional NFL, you know, and I thought that was fine. And we used to talk about this, but I remember a few times he'd say, you know what, Dad, I want to play professional football, but if I can't do that, I'll just sell car insurance. And I thought, that's a very feasible option. We sell car insurance, we bless you, thank you for what you do. But it was kind of amazing because he kind of like was always hedging his bets because like, I want to play professional football. But you know what? Car insurance is also a good option. Every one of us have that lifelong goal that we think when we get that, but it always feels out of reach. Everything we want in life, we often feel like there is just that thing that is just out of reach. Well, I can tell you on this day that Peter found the thing that he always wanted. When they dragged that onto shore, that would have set him and his family up for their entire lives. He has won the ancient lottery and yet he walks away. Does that not tell you something about the call of Jesus on the life of Peter? that of everything he ever wanted, he could leave it in order to follow Jesus. That tells me this. He knew something about Jesus that we so often forget, that in Jesus we have everything, that in Jesus we find what we are ultimately looking for. And look, as a man, I know you know this. I know you've probably heard it preached that maybe a hundred times, a thousand times. I know we know this, but sometimes I just think we forget it. We, we choose to find other things. We seek happiness over faith and what happens in this moment is Peter makes a decision to leave the ancient lottery behind and follow Jesus. He says something amazing, that from now on you'll catch people for life. I'll make you fishers of men. But the literal translation says this, you will catch people for life. Zoe greo, which is a Greek word which means catch people alive is a literal translation. I find that amazing. What does it actually mean to catch people alive? Well, if you think about it like this, in following Jesus and being a disciple, every now and then it feels like restrictions are over you. But can I tell you that the right kind of restrictions will lead to the right kind of freedom in the right time? It feels like sometimes that net goes over you, but when Jesus catches you, there are things for you to do as a disciple, but it is in those moments that He is actually setting you free. The right kind of restrictions in your life will ultimately lead you to freedom. Think about it like this. Perhaps you have a desire to be a supreme athlete, you know, the fastest long distance runner in the world or something to that effect. But you just can't help but eat 24 donuts every single day. You love your Krispy Kremes and you keep on stopping in at the servo. And can I tell you, if you want to be ultimately free, you have to remove some of the things that shouldn't be there. I kind of like watching musicians on a Sunday, you know, because they're unbelievable what they do. They're there playing guitar or playing drums and we'll look at it and we watch them and go, man, those guys, when they're up there shredding, they just look so free. But can I tell you where that came from? Hours and hours of sitting in their own room, practising, not being free. Because in not being free, they now are experiencing brand new freedom. You see, our idea of freedom is way off. Our idea of freedom is that we can do anything we want, but the right kind of freedom will actually set you free. In fact, in John 8, when Jesus talks specifically about what it means to be free, uh, the people of Israel came to Him and said, we have never been slaves to anyone. What does it mean to be free? And Jesus would say, well, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. But the people of Israel said, we have never been slaves to anyone. What are you talking about? that you've never been free. I love that comment. We've never been slaves to anyone. The people of Israel are saying that. I just want Jesus to stop and go, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, the Romans. In fact, every ancient culture has dominated you. You've never known what it likes to be free. Can I tell you, our perception of freedom is way off as well. 
What's amazing about Jesus telling Peter that you will catch people for life, it actually means that first and foremost, Peter was caught by Jesus. And as Peter was caught by Jesus, there was things that were placed over Peter's life, which may look like restriction on some level, but they will ultimately look like true freedom. I wonder if the reason why we struggle to answer the call is because we don't like the idea of anything being over us. I wonder sometimes we don't like to answer the call of God in our lives because we want to experience freedom to do anything. But Jesus is saying, my catching of you brings the right kind of discipleship, the right kind of restrictions over your life that will lead you ultimately to life. Sometimes we resist that. With this, I'll close. I find it amazing that In this encounter in Luke 5, Jesus encounters Peter and Peter says, Away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. And then in John 21, there's a lot that's happened. By the time we get to John's account, John 21, Peter has denied Jesus. He's turned his back on him. He's been an absolute weakling. In fact, the slave girls were asking if he associated with Jesus. He said, no, I've never met the man and he would flee and He denies Jesus three times. And then in John 21, we see that Jesus begins to walk along the shore. And as Jesus is walking along the shore, Peter recognises him. And it says something amazing in John 21, that he actually grabs his robe or his outer garment, throws it on himself and then jumps in the water and swims to shore. Now, I don't know about you, but typically when I swim, I am removing clothing, not adding clothing. But in John's account of Peter encountering Jesus as he walked along the shore, Peter, in fact, puts his outer garment on, jumps in the water. Now, I don't know what kind of dive it was. You've only got really three options, the straight dive there, the pencil dive or a bomb dive. It probably would have been a bomb dive. Peter jumps in the water with his outer garment and he runs to Jesus. The symbolism should never be missed. Do you know why Peter was throwing on his outer garment? Because he was planning on never returning to his old life ever again. He throws on his outer garment because he's now running to Jesus and following him. Do you not find it amazing that Peter initially encounters Jesus and says, away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. And then all that had happened for Peter, all of the betrayal and the denial, Peter is not running from Jesus. He's running to Jesus. What does this tell us about the nature and character of Christ that Peter discovered? Even on your worst day, we still got to run to him. Even when we feel like the failure is still there and the failure is still constant, we still have to run to him. And I want to ask you this morning, do you know Jesus like that? Have you in fact answered the call? Or maybe even in your own life, you know, Jesus is prompting things in you and you keep on putting it off and you keep on holding it off. But maybe this morning he's saying, would you just get a but because you say so in your spirit? We look for all kinds of reasons why. All kinds of things that perhaps we would express as failures and disappointments. And at the end of the day, Peter knew so much about his own weaknesses, his failings, but he jumped in the water and he said, I'll follow you, Jesus. And Jesus restores his relationship on that beach. And I want to pray for some men this morning. Why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment longer. I just feel just like Peter, the Lord's calling out to us. And maybe for some of us, you just got to get in your spirit, but because you say so. This morning, I guess I want to really hone in on that point. You see, you can be in this environment, and not have your heart drawn to Him. You can be around faith, you can be around church your whole life, but what really matters is if you'll step out and if you'll follow Him. And maybe even this morning, I just feel that there's been a lot of things that we've been putting off. As I was preparing for this, knowing that our theme was going to be today, that in this moment, in this session, I want you to put all of your reasons aside, all of your excuses aside, and I want you right now to get a, but because you say so. Some of us, it could be the inconvenience 
the awkwardness, the uncomfortability. I understand that. For some of us, it could be quite significant, a changing of your plans, putting your own ideas, agenda on hold. I can understand that. Peter relates to that. Or well, for some of us, ultimately, it really is. We are just so aware of our failures. But I just sense the Holy Spirit on this moment that through all of that, Jesus is calling and He's beckoning you. And that today, all of your reasons, all of your excuses, all of the things why, He's saying to you, just step out. Draw near to my heart. Come and catch people for life as I catch you for life. Come and experience what it means to truly live. Come and experience what it means to push everything else aside and follow me and that you would have in your spirit. But because you say so. Right across this place, you know exactly what it is. Right across this place, you know that what you've been putting off, what you've been avoiding, what you've been neglecting. In this moment right now, I just wanna pray for you. I wanna activate your faith that today would be the moment where you actually just make a call and go, but because you say so, I'll do it. For some of us, it's the very start. I'll live for you, Jesus. That's great. For some of you, you're actually going to make decisions to lead in your family. You're going to make some faith decisions in your household. You're going to make some decisions about your business and your community. But this morning, if you're saying, Nathan, I want that in my spirit. But because you say so in my spirit, I'm going to kick all the reasons, all the excuses aside. But today, I want to activate my faith. I want you to do something in a moment. We're always inviting you to do something physical in church because we so often leave everything in the realm of our personal private life. That's actually not how we're meant to live as Christians. That's not how we're meant to live as faith, as as people who are faith-filled believers. And so what I would love to do as men, just activate you right now. This is the start, we'll have one more session, but I want to activate your faith. If you're saying today, Nathan, I want that in my spirit uh, because you said so in my spirit. And maybe you're saying you know what it is you've been putting off and today you want to expose it before the Lord. You don't have to shout it out or bring it to the front, but today you're saying, I want to activate my faith today, right now in this moment. I want you to do something brave because you're in a room full of men and I believe this is the perfect setting to step up in faith. If you're saying, I want that in my spirit today, but because you say so in my spirit and what I've been putting off and kicking down the road, I'm gonna go for it. And I don't care about the consequences. I don't care about what it's gonna look like. I'm, I wanna follow you, Jesus, in this way. And you're a Christ follower. You've been walking with Him for a long time, but you know you've been putting off whatever it is in your world for you to activate in your faith. I want you in a moment to jump to your feet. I'm gonna count to three. And then I want you to jump straight to your feet. And in doing that, you're activating your faith. You're saying, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day I'm stepping up. Today is the moment. I'm not gonna just be passive about that in my life anymore. I've been putting it off, but I wanna go after it. On three, I want you to stand to your feet if that's you. And perhaps you've been a Christian for a very long time. This is another part of your life or faith journey. On three, I want you to jump to your feet and be brave about it. One, two, three. Stand straight up. Activate your faith. Awesome. Thank you, Lord. Welcome, your Holy Spirit. Just open your hands before the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Welcome, your Holy Spirit. Jesus, we thank You that You respond to faith. Sometimes it's mustard seed faith. Sometimes it's faith can move mountains, but You respond to faith. Jesus, and I thank You for the men who are just bravely standing to their feet, who are literally saying, I want in my spirit this simple word to resonate, but because You say so. Every one of us standing knows exactly what it is, what we've been putting off, what we've been struggling with, what we've been holding on to. And so Jesus, today we make a decision to step towards You, 
to have a, but because you say so in our spirit, that today would be the day. Today would be the day we step before You. Today would be the day that we actually experience Your embrace. Today would be the day we begin to see miracles as we realise on the other side of this, You've got great things in store for us. So I pray for every man standing right now, that by Your Holy Spirit, You would seal this work, this activation moment, Lord. Lord, that they would no longer put off the things of God, but they would run after You. And Father, that You would highlight exactly those things even this morning. And You strengthen them by Your Holy Spirit, by Your power and Your grace. Jesus, imagine a room full of men living this way, Lord. Imagine the change and transformation. Imagine the miracles on the other side of this. And I bless the work You're doing right now. Holy Spirit, seal that work. Stir Your men afresh, we pray. In Jesus' Name. Man. Just hold this for a moment. Just you speak to him. Just you don't have to use your mouth. You can just speak in your heart if you want. But you know what it is. You've been putting off. You've been holding back. Just have a conversation with your heavenly Father right now. Experience his affirmation right now. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.